Um, it's, my, it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce the 2016 Distinguished Economic Botanist. Um, when I was preparing for this, I thought, wow, I, there's so many great things to say about Tony. And I have many of his books <laughs> in my own personal library, which I wish I'd brought from the sign this trip. I'll remember next time. Um, but really, when I was going through his CV, which is expansive, and going through the nomination letters, I really thought that the best way to present him is through um, a few excerpts from the letters that came in to nominate him. So I'm going to read some of the things that others um, put forward in his nomination. Over the past 35 years, Tony Cunningham has made major contributions to economic botany and ethnobotany and embodies the spirit of the distinguished economic botanist. In our view, he is outstanding in his dedication and passion to advancing scientific research, promoting sustainable and environmentally and socially just livelihoods, and mentoring students on people-plant relationships. He has been a pioneer in linking traditional knowledge, local resource use, and conservation. He is a foremost leader in the field of ethnoecology. He is also widely known for his, for his developing a suite of rigorous research methods for studying the formal and informal market systems of non-timber forest products as a means to evaluate the in situ effects of harvest for plant and animal species with both local and global value as a way to inform conservation prioritization. He has applied these with Prunus africana and other medicinal barks in Africa, Chinese mushrooms and traditional medicines, and top tropical hardwood carvings and tropical birds to name a few. Tony has acquired an incredible amount of field experience across Africa, Asia, Australia, and the Pacific over many years and has integrated his own research with field courses and teaching students across the globe. Notably, he has accomplished all of this in the face of adversity. This includes dangerous field conditions such as South Africa under apartheid and negotiating a solid research and teaching career without a tenured university position despite holding honorary professorships at several universities. Tony's PhD at the University of Cape Town, which was completed between 1980 and 1985, was a groundbreaking quantitative study of the values of plants to local people. In 1986, he started South Africa's first ethnobotany program called the Southern Life Ethnobotany Program at the Institute of Natural Resources where in addition to mentoring students, he carried out the first detailed study of the traditional medicines, med medicine trade in South Africa. This was not an easy task at a time of burning barricades and assassinations under apartheid. On the cusp of leaving South Africa in 1991, he wrote the framework for the national program that continues today as the Indigenous Plant Use Forum, or IPA, who we partnered, partnered with last year. Starting in 1993, the first national grants for economic and ethnobotanical research enabled university departments and young graduates to further develop this field in South Africa. Today, this program continues to be funded by South Africa's national, national Research Foundation and holds its, held its first joint meeting with SED in South Africa last year. Through his re teaching, research, articles, books, and videos, he has inspired students across the globe. He is driven by a true dedication to indigenous and local communities and to conservation, and is a role model for all of us because of his high standards of ethics demonstrated by his research that he truly engages, collaborates with, and shows respect for local stakeholders, ensuring the protection of intellectual property rights, and also recognizes local counterparts as co-authors and collaborators. He is one of the most dedicated, passionate, enthusiastic, and tireless people either of them have ever met. And I have to say that I agree. Tony, it is a great pleasure to offer you this award. Okay, well, it's 
scientists, you know, you never to believe what you hear. <laughs> or read. Okay. But thanks so much. It, it does mean a lot to me. And, um, well, I'll, I, I really don't know what to say more than thank you. That's, uh, what I'll do is I'll get on with the, 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 the talk. And, uh, <laughs> so, who was at the SCB meeting in Can William last year? Okay, so you would have been to Dan Moman's uh, DEB talk where he talked about the accidental ethnobotanist. So, in, in a way, uh, you know, this is uh, the itinerant ethnobotanist. <laughs> Tenuous rather than tenured. But before I start, I really wanted to firstly, you know, thank SUB for enabling me to get here, and you know, Cassie for your you have built this incredible team of people, and all of you have contributed, you know, so much to our field. Being at Pine Mountain, um, being here, sunshine. Thanks to you and your team. Yeah. And Jeff, Marietta, where is Jeff? Ah, oh, okay. Well, let, let me just say that I think Pine Mountain, as a conference venue, is an absolute winner. And, you know, there has, that has to be a source of income that's, you know, there's a real market for it. And so what a great place to, to be. And then to Joyce and the team in the kitchen, you know, I'd like to thank them personally for that. But we've got to the end of quite an intense conference and we've been talking a lot of science, but I think it's, it's good to just get on to the lighter side of things. So, you know, that's why there's this, you know, true confessions of an itinerant ethnobotanist. <laughs> and in fact, this, uh, uh, Becca Zita Guala, who's looking at this massive part of Zulu beer at a wedding that we were at, and he, Becca uh, Zita Guara, wrote the poem for the front of my thesis, which was about his home area, Ramklava Lindana, which means the place of flat earth. But anyway, you know, we all used to be young and strong and free and all that sort of thing, and <laughs> that was a long time ago. <laughs> so I'm going to just quickly explain what, what I mean by itinerant, and then outline the overview of the talk, and it'll go from there. So why itinerant, or you know, what's a real job? And uh, that's that's where we got stuck in the mud, you know, in a field trip near the Mozambique border. And I've taken my shirt off to try and keep it clean, <laughs> even though my white shorts were absolutely black with mud. Anyway, <laughs> uh, a real job is con commonly considered one that pays a regular salary, that isn't temporary, it has room for advancement and, you know, there's health insurance and so on. But maybe it's a job that's, that really has any of the above, but it's personally so fulfilling that it takes up the whole of one's life. And I think a recurrent theme through this whole week has been two sets of questions. You know, what motivates us to do what we do? And how can we do what we do better? And that's what I want to talk to. Weaving in personal stories with a message particularly for student members of SUB. So the overview of the talk is, first of all, my background in eight of these confessions, right? Then to weave the story. You know, weaving has been a theme of the week, thanks to Sunshine's interest. And I'm a self-confessed complete basket case <laughs> I spent five years with, with a colleague working on this book, unfunded. But really, nobody walks a path on their own, very, very rarely. We're always following a trail, even if it's overgrown. We weave our paths over time, you know, past others. We meet people, and then we meet them again. And I'm, I can give you one example of that. So, 1982 was my first sort of advisory job outside of South Africa 
because I've been working on prime leaf production rates and dyes. I was in a village called Kavani, and I met charming and eccentric Englishman. And uh, here he is. Four <laughs> years later. Yeah, it's weaving is the analogy. You know, not we our lives are woven together, but also we use different methods. We form collaborative partnerships. And by weaving methods together, weaving those partnerships together, you know, we don't do things with one strand. Multiple strands makes things strong. And that's the theme. I want to go on to talking about three reasons why ethnobotany needs to go from awkward adolescence to maturity and ask five questions about a way forward and then conclude. Okay. So confession number one is I'm really glad I didn't become an accountant. <laughs> but if any of you fall asleep in this talk, I'm going to have to change my profession. <laughs> Secondly, I'm completely allergic to bureau crazy, and uh, my last real job was in 1983 when I was working with the conservation department, was always in Berlin. And the other part of it is that I absolutely love field work. So by avoiding bureaucracy and advancement, I've maximised learning in the field, and I think we all. The more time we spend in the field, the more we learn. But in a way, it's kind of back to the future. This was a, an economist issue this year. And it talked about networks, freelancing, and in our case, scientific networks. In the, the economist article case, workers on tap, specialists that are brought in on tap. And I'll come back to that point later. So I want to reflect on how the world has changed in terms of you know, e-networks and access to information. Because the internet connects us as never before. It really is an amazing opportunity for not only good science, but doing better science. So this is probably the strangest plant species or plant genus in the world. It's Hydnora. But one of Linnaeus' students, Carl Peter Thunberg, who is considered to be the father of South African botany and also did the first flora of Japan while he lived on the island Dejima, or the fake island, because the foreigners were not allowed in Japan. He published this paper in 1775. Now, I desperately wanted to get a copy of it. Oops, sorry. Now, if I had tried to get a copy in 1980, I would have failed. But in 2010, I looked on the internet, I looked, okay, there's the Linnaean Society in Uppsala, they might have it, and there was a group in London that might have it, and I googled, you know, email address. Within two days, I had a PDF of a 1775 paper by Carl Peter Thunberg, who described how Nora as a mushroom, by the way. Anyway, um, the point is that, you know, we have so many advantages now and we should take every advantage of it. Thirdly, what am I? And I absolutely appreciate the award, but I have no idea. <laughs> you know, maybe I'm just a, a practical problem solver, you know, taking a systems approach. On one hand, you know, I do ethnobotanical field work, in that case in Flores, Indonesia. On the other, I set up um, links between um, harvesters of wild plants, uh, doing sustainable management with, with businesses, and in that case of that plant with the little red berries, it's Shazandra, Sinanthra. So working with Joseph Brinkman, who some of you may know, traditional medicinals in California, and Chinese colleagues, um, you know, that's a business that's been running now for um, nearly 10 years. But on the other hand, I, I do art. I, I, um, that's an income stream for me. And I'll talk in a bit about also doing this. It's a, like a genocide memorial to draw attention to 
the killing of elephants that's happening in northern Mozambique. And that actually pulls together knowledge of cultural links to plants, <coughs> to burial places, and you know, it's all of the skills brought together to resonate um, so that the message for conservation is carried forward. But sometimes the art and science worlds link up briefly. So uh, the person designing the NYBG website decided to use one of my prints. And um, yeah, that was, was good to see it all coming together. But I think the point is that you know, we need to use our multiple skills. And you know, Cassie, you've been great at, at using video, for example to communicate, and art itself can communicate. And this was a, a book about the construction of this memorial about elephants. And it's not constructed by one person, it might be conceptualized by one, but it was a whole team of people that built that, including ex-hunters. So I think the point I'm trying to make is we should never lose sight of the fact, and this is a great quote from this 1950 book, Never lose sight of the fact that academic boundaries are man-made. They are artificial divisions of convenience, and at best, they do violence to the unity of reality. The fourth point or confession is the power of mentors. And these are some of the people that have really contributed to my professional career, it's, it's not really a career, it's just an all-consuming life. So I've battled to get a place to register for a, a postgraduate degree, but Eugene Moll at the University of Cape Town was prepared to give it a go, even though he was a couple of thousand kilometers away, and he said, okay, well, I'll give you a hat to hang your hat on, I mean a hook to hang your hat on, and then you can take it from there. So, um, Olive Hilliard and Kath Gordon Gray, they both were taxonomists. Olive ran the herbarium. Very strict about quality of plant specimens. Fantastically supportive. Um, Ken Tinley, a landscape ecologist. 1976 and 77, I worked with Mike Robinson, who's in the center there. He used to be at the University of Arizona. He's a herpetologist. My first paper co with him was in 1978 on lizard diet, of all things, in the Nome of Desert. Jacobo uh, Bandusio, a very knowledgeable batois and uh, Abayanda pygmy fan working in Uganda. We worked together, students of mine in Uganda worked with him for over a decade. And then Casey Malotra, I think there's someone in the audience that also knows Casey here. Or maybe she's left. Anyway, he's an anthropologist in India. And we all have our mentors. And I think that investing in good mentoring and mentoring good students is about the best investment that anyone can make. The fifth one is the influences of different world views. This is in Tlanganani, Brazil, in Natal, 1987. I was working for the Institute of Natural Resources. You'll see the sign of the vehicle there. This is Ima Sorwazi in Meguyembe, or that's the Zulu. Institute for Natural Resources Equipment. But it's really through field-based discussions, you know, reading theories in cognitive anthropology, uh, linguistics, and through entheogens, that we are privileged to realize the many lenses through which the world is viewed. It might be people saying, well, that bird has a message, it's telling you something. Or beetles in, in Papua New Guinea have symbolism. There's a study that I think records 35 local names for Bilum just in one community. And there's different sizes and so on. And then, yeah, some of you might recognize what's in the glass there. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so a really important thing for me was helping found, and that was with Alan Hamilton, who's over there, second along, and Gary Martin the WWF UNESCO um, People and Plants Initiative. So this was after I'd left South Africa for Namibia. Uh, the cover for the Indigenous Plants program, which was the 
the funding that IPAC drew from, in fact, features one of the Isangorma that was in that previous photograph. Uh, and Isangorma is um, uh, someone who is a herbalist, often generally female, um, and talks to ancestors, interprets dreams, and so on. So I was really gratified by last year's ECB meeting jointly with IPAC. But it was the People and Plants Initiative that where I really feel I found an intellectual you know, home of like-minded people. And it was a very cost-effective network, and I think a model that's worth considering again. It gave, sorry. It's enabled um, a, a group of us to have resources to do things and in my case an effort to bring these systems approaches and quantitative methods <coughs> together it's seriously need up of updating and i think you know there's ways of doing things now through the internet that we can have internet-based living methods manuals like the super ethnoecology wiki type of thing bringing in people that did team teaching uh, that's myself javier caballero some of you may know from Luna in mexico and Gary Martin, which was a quantitative ethnobotany course in Kenya in 1996, and teaching excellent thematic field courses. This is in Gwindi and Pinchable National Park in Uganda. Where's Duncan Tiso? Hey, Duncan, I think Her uh, Harrington or Moriga was in that group. Okay. And bringing in people from other universities, Jeremy Mitchley is a world renowned. Um, functional ecologist, University of Cape Town, but this was his very first trip to East Africa. Okay, the seventh confession, if you like, is, you know, it deals with outsiders. Now, who, who remembers Colin Wilson's book, The Outsider? Okay, yeah. And I think many of us are outsiders. And then Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell's book, probably better known. Mm -hmm. Many of you have read that. So how does that apply to us? And you know, I really like this Malcolm Gladwell thing of, you know, before a certain age, and I think this is a cutoff was 20, you needed to put in 10,000 hours of practice, whether you were going to become a violinist, a baseball player, or, you know, a computer buffing. But you needed lucky opportunities, some sort of cultural legacy, upbringing, good timing, you know, like. Gladwell goes into the story of Steve Jobs and, and so on. And then, you know, some level of success. So how does that apply to any of us? And I think every one of the people in the room has a story. And I think those stories would be fascinating. It's almost like a research project, what brought us to do what we do. In my case, the 10,000 hours was definitely there, as were the lucky opportunities, and as were the upbringing. This is my grandfather's brother. Um, during the Boer War, he was an intelligence officer fighting against the Boers. It was the world's first guerrilla war. And you know, he's, he's the only white African in that group of Sutu speakers. It's actually a very rare photograph. He died when he was 22. The year of the photograph was taken. Mm. So my grandfather, when he was older, he was at a place where they, he was a magistrate and a Zulu linguist. He contributed to this book on ethnomusicology much earlier. But I grew up with that background, uh, lucky enough to have this field guide on wildflowers of Natal, uh, Zulu Natal, which I'll talk about. But I was an absolute mad keen butterfly collector. Mm -hmm. It's probably a bit politically incorrect to collect butterflies these days, but I did see some butterfly nets mm -hmm. down in the Draper building. But I stopped collecting butterflies in around about 1969 and um, started breeding them out on plants. And, you know, butterflies in a way were the teachers to me about botany. In quite serious ways, because, for example, that's a swallowtail butterfly which mimics a bird dropping on a plant in the Rutaceae, and earlier lineages of the swallowtails feed on Loraceae and Anonaceae. You know, you start making all sorts of linkages there. 
So what about field guides and the future? So I had this good fortune of my granddad having the book. It was a book that was about plants in my home area and I used to spend lots of time in the woods, but it also had Zulu names and uses. I think it was the only field guide at the time that had that information. And so there it is in Dolo Bornville, where Bornville means red in Brenvine, which means butterfly, and it's referring to these different hibiscus species. <coughs> a best selling book in the US has been this last child in the woods. It's a, a book about nature deficit disorder, you know, the concern that children feel, spend so much time watching TV or you know being inside. I'm about to become an accountant, Suzanne, if you fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> but I wonder about that because you know now there's apps, you know, to young people are interested in not miss well, some are in the hard copy, but there are wonderful apps available for plant identification. And judging from our walk to the summit the other day, I have complete <laughs> faith in, in the youth of today. <laughs> People photographing this, it's the rock, uh, rock uh, trunk, which is, I think, edible, used as a dye, but also quite vulnerable. And absolutely, you know, technology and curiosity are as there as alive as anywhere. The eighth and final of the sort of confessions is, I think we are ignorant about ignorance. The, the, the role of ignorance in driving our thirst for knowledge. Now I think this is a great quote, and there's a lot of literature on this issue. So there I am, sitting in northern Mozambique in Nyasa, looking at this complex cultural and ecological landscape, having found Hadnora there, it's still officially not on the floor of Mozambique. A use that's completely unrecorded, but well known to local potters. Having used the only available dictionary, in GR, which was from 1871. <laughs> and I think, you know, this quote can apply to any of us. You know, the crucial lesson was that the scope of things I didn't know wasn't really vast. It was, for all practical purposes, infinite. That realization, instead of being discouraging, was liberating. And I think that goes for all of us. And that is the best thing about what we do. We learn and learn and learn. It never will stop because it's infinite. And I, I think these, these are two of the really good papers that are worth following up. Okay. So this is uh, getting on to the career part. This is a great book. And in Nolan and Nancy Turner's chapter on ethnobotany, you know, they mention how ethnobotany can lead to a fulfilling career, etc. Which is a genuine concern of all student members. But I think what we do is more than a career. So we do have to be aware of measures of motivation and success. So policy makers and funders, that typically measure the value of science on the basis of efficiency, you know, value for public money. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Outputs, you know, citation indices, well, there's a lot of papers that express doubts about it, but the reality is that's how people with jobs are measured. And then outcomes focus on sort of economic or technological um, impacts. But it isn't taken into account in the career side of things, which luckily I've sort of sidestep. Is it <coughs> the value of our applied work with local communities and positive non-academic outcomes? And this also needs to be recognized. But what about ourselves? And I think we shouldn't ignore the personal benefits that motivate all of us. So here's five personal reasons why it's worth it. And this was about six weeks ago, uh, working in northern Namibia. It's an area that I know very well. Great timing because it's marula fruiting season. And in north central Namibia, People carve those beautiful goblets, and on a hot day, there's nothing better. Okay. So, you know, if you look at people all over the world, particularly sort of, I'd say, industrialized countries, people are searching, you know, what, 
leads to a fulfilling, happy life. And you can look on the internet, you know, there's 10 things to do, 50 things to do, etc. But I would say, why worry about the 10 choices when there's one? Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, and it's a personal thing, but certainly being an ethnobotanist or ethnocologist did it for me. And here are five personal reasons why. First of all, fieldwork teaches us to live fully and treasure every moment. So I want to just pay a tribute to somebody and talk about two sort of slow motion stories. So the tribute is, is to Rob Scott Shaw. He was on that first 1976 collecting trip. And literally within 60 kilometers of this, where this photograph was taken, he had an accident and you know, died as, as a result of that. But he was a brilliant botanist who, who made a major contribution in the area. And uh, yeah, we've all got good memories about good times with people that aren't necessarily with us anymore. This is a story from the first time I was in China. It was the second um, ISE meeting, which was held in Kunming, but with a field trip down to Shushumbana. And you might recognize some of the folks in this photograph. Let me get my pointer. Um, so, Elois, uh, Elois Anne Berlin, Brent Berlin there, Patient G, very young Patient G, Alejandro de Vila, who runs a botanical garden in Oaxaca, Gary Martin, and Javier Cavalera. And I, I, there's quite a few Mexican ethnobiologists in that photograph, some of you may recognize others. The point is that we would, there were four buses, and the one I was in had a whole bunch of people that have gone on to make major contributions, um, in addition to my, sort of my own one. <laughs> but we were going along this really wet road, and that time in China it was vehicles were either bicycles or heavy duty transport vehicles, and it was wet, and it was a big steep slope on one side and a ditch on a hill on the other. We went into a skid, a 180 degree spin. Slow motion, I'll never forget it, between two oncoming trucks. And instead of going down the slope, which would have been the end of us, we whacked into the side and into the ditch. And there's Patient G, Gary and me sort of working on how to get the bus out of the ditch. But it would have been, it was an almost instant brain drain there. <laughs> okay, so it's not just Gladwell's lucky opportunities, it's, it's lucky escapes. Okay, we all know Chuck, well many of you know Chuck Peters. So this is the story of Chuck Peters and the 500 pound gorilla. <laughs> so I got Chuck Peters to come to Uganda and, you know, we covered his flight but couldn't cover his time so the reward was to see mountain gorillas in the wild, which we did. And so walking with Ugandan colleagues and there was this big group of gorillas and there was a massive silverback male and then a subdominance, but also a massive male gorilla. And the subdominant male was so busy eating, you know, that he lost track of where the others were. And there was quite a slope and we were down slope. And all of a sudden he looked up and panicked. The others had disappeared into the forest and on two legs and then just ran with these massive arms out like this. Now, if any of you know Chuck, he's not a big guy. <laughs> and literally, I just remember the hand of the gorilla sweeping these lianas inches away from Chuck. So, you know, the Cincinnati Zoo incident that happened last week, well, you know, this would have been something else. <laughs> so it was a very close encounter of the gorilla kind, and it would have been a tragedy to, to lose Chuck. So the point is, we need to treasure every moment we have. <coughs> the second sort of life lesson is through fieldwork, we learn not to worry about the problems we can't control, whether they're big or small, and that there's always a plan B. So this was a project in China on medicinal plants and the trade around the giant panda reserves. And just as the project was getting off the ground was the Sichuan earthquake. 19,000 people died. And this 
and a vehicle was crossing the bridge at the same time. That went, you know, apart from, you know, shortly after the earthquake, we just carried on. The roads were turned into construction sites. The aftershocks, I mean, I still can't sleep in a hotel high-rise building near an elevator because <laughs> as soon as the room starts rocking, I, you know, <laughs> I want to rush out. But the point is, we've all got tales of field work and continuing despite disasters. And I'm going to give you one that's not mine. I have a very tenuous link to it. So, this is, I worked uh, as the Wilder Chair, I think Cassie mentioned that, for an eight month period at the University of Hawaii. So, that's where, where Mil Will McClatchy was, and uh, it's thanks to him I got there in the first place. But the building is named after Professor Harold St. John. And he was a very enthusiastic professor and he would get his taxonomy students to come for a walk with him every Sunday. So on this particular Sunday, 7th of December 1941, they were walking in the mountains behind Honolulu and they heard this noise and they just saw these aircraft just coming in, hundreds. And they looked at them, okay. And then another lot came in, and then in the distance, they looked down at the harbor and they just saw you know, bombing going on. This is what they saw. And they were Japanese zeros, which was Pearl Harbor. And so after a while of this, you know, St. John just says to his students, okay, that's enough, let's carry on. Look <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's nothing they could do about it. Okay. I think the third one is we learn to embrace the great opportunities we have, developing gratitude and reflective minds. You know, whether it's enough food on the table, we work often in communities that are culturally rich, lots of knowledge, but materially poor. And I think that's a gift. And I think we benefit in more ways than we know. So how many of you are bilingual? I'll get on to the multilingual bit later. More than three, more, three languages or more? Okay, fantastic. So, okay, sorry, I've gone kind of ahead of myself a bit. I think, you know, how does this benefit us personally? And I'm not sure if you're aware of the, there's a lot of research that shows how multi bilingualism and then more recent work on multilingualism improves cognition, literacy environmental awareness, out-of-the-box thinking, and then a recent study that shows that um, bilingualism um, slows down the onset of Alzheimer's by four or five years. I thought that was pretty amazing. The fourth one is we only live once, but if we do it right, once is enough. <coughs> And I think it's important of the ethics thing. It's like the Crosby, Stills, Nash, Nash and Young song about, you know, you who are on the road must have a code that you can live by. And I think we all have real opportunities to influence policy reform, you know, from the ground up. So much policy is created by lawyers and politicians who are away from reality. But we can influence things. And, you know, I'm just working in my home office, I don't have a building, I don't have a team. But even on that scale, you know, I've done a legal lobbying study for the German Nature Conservation Agency. They've now taken it up to the level the negotiations are from the German government to the Tanzanian, Kenyan and Mozambican governments, leading up to the CITES meeting that will be in September. Or, you know, work for the Australian government and so on. Um, we can all be doing that, and I'm sure many of you do. And so we can do this, and we can do good science, you know, even if it takes unexpected turns. And I'm going to tell you a short story. Okay. Where sometimes there are misunderstandings, and so it's a winding road. So early in my field work, I worked with a local Tembetonga guy from Lingokwala. His mother was a herbalist, he was very knowledgeable about plants. But an entomologist friend had asked me to collect ficus tremula fruits because he was working on fig wasps. Now I had spent 
several years working with Lingo and we walk through the bush and you know, do what ethnobotanists do. We collect plant specimens, but we would smell things, eat things, etc., etc. So I knew where there was a group of ficus tremula, drove as far as we could, walked through the bush, I climbed up the tree, picked the fruits, passed them to Lingo, we go back through the bush, get to the vehicle, and I get the box, put them in, and I'll turn to him. The poor guy, he, he ate every single one. Big ones to know. So back we go, and it was a new species. <laughs> now what we do gives us real purpose. So, you know, what is purpose? I love this quote, you know, purpose is the place where your deep gladness meets the world's needs. And I think what better time to do this now as we face major global challenges and there are new tools, new techniques and opportunities for forming cross-disciplinary networks and you know, doing really original research. Okay, just to talk about challenges and opportunities and then questions and conclusions. Right, so um, Mark mentioned this report already, so I'll go through it very quickly. It's the most recent report from Q. I think it came out, you know, five or six weeks ago on the state of the world's plants. It mentioned, for example, how Facebook led to the discovery of this one and a half meter high Drosera magnifica, um, a single mountain in Minas Gerais in, in Brazil. It, it talks about species loss and we have lots to do. So they mentioned the number of plants, the number of new species being described annually, about 2,000 a year. And this was the amazing thing to me, that in this review of 11 databases, there were only 31,000 odd plants for the use. That's only 8%. I, I'm, I was amazed by that because, you know, you think of, we all familiar with the quantitative ethnobotanical studies or own field experience, you know, where it's 50%, 70%, you know, it's amazing. So there's lots and lots of work we, we can do. Language loss, is it a proxy for knowledge loss? I know that um, Ina van den Broek and Mike Bailey wrote a paper sort of querying that. But I think it depends on which part of the world you're in. Certainly in this part of the world and in Australia, this recent um, SIL, it's a 2013 paper, suggested that more than 75% of languages that were in use in 1915 in Australia, Canada and the US are now either extinct or moribund. Africa is at the other extreme. There's, you know, living languages, living culture, less than 10% of languages are extinct or moribund. And then other regions, you know, it's kind of half. It's, it's certainly worth contemplating on what that represents for <coughs> loss of knowledge. Okay, the third point, I think this has to be the most exciting time uh, for us to be working. And there's a number of reasons for that. I mean, um, I don't know if any of you know Frances Arnold. I don't know her, but she's at Caltech. She's just got uh, a million euro award through the, it's the Millennium Innovation Prize in, awarded in Helsinki for what's called directed evolution, and it's to do with biosynthetic pathways, <coughs> looking at enzymes out of nature, and then working with them. Uh, this was um, the review on antimicrobial resistance was launched again about three or four weeks ago by an economist in the UK, O'Neill, mm -hmm. who has who mentions in that report that the British government and the Chinese government have each put in 72 million US dollars into the Global Innovation Fund to deal with that as the kickstart for a you know, multiple billion dollar fund just for antimicrobial resistance. Now, as field ethnobotanists, we are at the coal face. You know, we can form global collaborative partnerships for problem solving. Who knows about biosynthetic pathways, enzymes in plants, plants with antimicrobial resistance. We do. So where are we in all of this? And I think there's incredible opportunities 
time depth, ancient DNA, for example, landscape genomics, new gene editing tools, um, and links to crop wild relatives. I mean, those are all out there. So I think we should be part of this, and yet, amazingly, SEB faces declining membership. So how can we turn this around and market ourselves better? So I think it, uh, the, you know, ethnobotany is the science of survival. And I won't read this out, but it's from this Kauai Declaration that was published in Economic Botany. It's a really worthwhile document to revisit, I think. And it's not only ethnobotany that's declining, it's, it's a whole range of institutions that are facing real crisis. And so, for example, Kew Gardens. They've lost 700 years worth of experience since they started making cuts. They didn't stop them, they continued. Mm. And I think under those circumstances we need to ask, you know, how can we build cost-effective vibrant networks? And we need to think about hubs and connectors. CSIRO in Australia, it's an Arab continent, they're in the process of closing down their uh, centre in Alice Springs, their one and only ethnobotanist has gone into sort of forced retirement, if you like. And even the CG centres are running into major funding crises. So, where are the most vibrant hubs in our field? We know where they are. For example, in Europe, you know, Austria, Albania, Estonia, quite a range of European countries. In Africa, I would say Benin. Giselle, are you around? Great to have you here, and uh, Ethiopia, certainly, Kenya, Matisa, it's great you here, Mozambique and South Africa, in Asia, certainly China and India, India there's real room for, I think, um, improved methods, but that probably goes for anywhere, Latin America and North America, you know, those are very vibrant hubs or hubs with potential. So what we have to ask ourselves, what are the barriers to new cost-effective ways of working and how can they be overcome? Okay, so I think that leads on to the question of how can we capitalize on the energy, passion and purpose of young scientists? And I think we're in really good shape there. Um, it's not just you know, shoots and roots, it's young scientists as the shoots that are deeply rooted in our science and committed. Now these are relatively old documents, but they're still extremely valuable as lessons for how to build on that. The last one is a personal one. How can an experience with itinerant scientists, and I'm not the only one out there, there's lots of us, link into vibrant hubs or networks as teachers or mentors? So the Wilder position, for which I'm really grateful, gave me an eight-month opportunity to teach courses. And I teach thanks to the Christensen Fund in Papua New Guinea. And I love teaching, but I maybe teach once every 18 months. And there's others out there who could also be brought in. Okay, the fourth out of five questions and then we're done, is how, when and where could um, a vision and a plan for a vibrant network be put together? And I think you know, that's, Braganza is a good opportunity. Mm -hmm. And how can outs outsiders become part of a network scientific revolution in applied ethnoecology? You're familiar with Thomas Kuhn's you know, structure of scientific revolutions. And we all, in a way, are outsiders who can play a role to catalyze that leading edge of what becomes mainstream, and then it's the next one and the next one. So I think we're in a different world now. You know, we're in an on-demand economy era. It's that workers on tap that I talked about. An era of Uber, an era of doctors on demand. So can we learn from cooperative science networks in the 21st century that create a sort of Thomas Kuhn on steroids? Astronomers do it. You know, they want to answer questions like, is the universe expanding or contracting? They have serious theory. They have serious hypotheses. They network and they solve problems. Why can't we? 
So just to conclude, we work in an exciting and highly relevant field which we need to get serious about taking ethnobotany from an awkward adolescence to maturity. And there is a long and a recent history of doing it, doing so, but how? And I just wanted to thank, thank the Nancy for organizing the workshop on the Teacher <coughs> Tuesday. You know, I think the ideas that came out of that and from all the participants were really great. It reminded me a little bit about um, sketch plans, very rough sketch plans for a, for a medieval cathedral. You know, you've got to start somewhere, including getting the stonemason to do the first block on the solid foundations. You know, so the question is, should we start to build and implement a nuanced cooperative vision and a long-term plan on research excellence in the science of survival? And maybe the, the SUV meeting in Braganza is, is a place to start. And perhaps a sort of meeting of minds or a neural network could be something so creative and lasting that it would be greater than any of us. And so I wanted to thank you for the award. Thank you for listening. Thank you for staying awake. I'll stay with being an ethnobotanist. And I think that this uh, Sangrada Familia in Barcelona, which started in 1882 and is due for completion around about 2026, is a, is a creative example of that building something bigger than any of us, but in a virtual sense in our case. So, thanks again. If any of you have any any questions, mm. oh, so that's great, Tony. How do we um, avoid preaching to the choir? Mm. It's easy for us to talk to ourselves yeah. and say what how great we could be and what potential we have. But how do we bridge the gap into those other disciplines? Okay, thanks. <clears throat> I think. I, I, okay, I, the, what, the reason I mentioned the model of the people and plants initiative was that for that short period, where 12 years, where bits and pieces of money were cobbled together, cost effectively, with a relatively small team, um, something bigger than any of the individuals working there was created, and it, it made a significant contribution. But I think we have the capacity now for doing that on a much grander scale, where the, the building blocks are not geographic initially, they are thematic. And, and we talked about that in, in the meeting today, you've got your chapters. We talked about the interest in bringing in SOE or other societies. And in the choir, in this cathedral, you know, the, the choir, are there, they might be doing their day-to-day -day stuff, like we do our day-to-day -day stuff, and people are focused on only doing their thing, looking at the citation indices. But I think we need something that brings us out of that, something bigger than ourselves. And it is possible. And um, what we should do, we have 12 months. Okay, this is how do we do it, rather than just talk about it. We have 12 months between now and the Braganza meeting. We know who the champions are in the different hubs. We know what they are interested in. Christian Furtel in Austria is interested in home gardens, for example. Andrea Pirani in Italy you know, is interested in such and such. Ulysses Albuquerque in Brazil is interested in such and such, etc., etc. We need to get those folks and the um, student members, and I'd say, get the, the sort of silverback males and females together 
to sell them the grand vision. Yeah, everyone has egos, but there's, there's enlightened self-interest here because I think we can all benefit from something bigger than ourselves. And it's not instant, it's going to take time. Now one project would be building on what Hank and Nancy had a workshop on. Now in three hours, you know, I was amazed at how much original stuff was achieved. Pika, you were part of that, and um, but you know it's something that takes time to build. But you know it's a, a virtual resource, this super wiki, you know, ethnoecology resource pack is, some, is kind of something that could be done as a goal. You know, and within each theme, each theme leader can tap into pots of money. And then a condition of those that then that can be dished out to people across geographic regions, but it's got to be thematic first. Three to five percent of the money that's raised needs to go into the umbrella body. So what I'm talking about is not just a vision, but a plan. And I, I'm sure you've heard the saying, you know, that I've just got to think of how it goes. But it's something along the lines of a vision without a plan is just a dream, and plan without a vision is drudgery, but a vision with a plan can change the world. And I think that's what we're talking about. So by getting people together before the Braganza meeting, who are the sort of silverback males and females, into the same place, we drink together, we enjoy food together, we go on a field trip together, we get back to our roots, and then we work out a detailed game plan. Part of that game plan is a funding plan. There's more money than there are good ideas out there. And we can get that better as a group than we can as individuals. I think that's what we should be aiming for. I'm sorry it's a bit of a weird and wonderful answer, but it's a very good question. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. One can posit that the archetypal hunter-gatherer extended family groups when they met a neighboring band. There was an era of them deciding what to do about that contact. If we meet up with genomic experts, gene doctors, whatever you want to call them, they already have their extended family. That's one example. But what you're in essence saying is it's the bringing together of disparate disciplines that can catalyze so much more activity. But I'm not quite sure how you go along with your white flag. Uh, we don't need a white flag. We have intermediaries sent from our band to the other band, namely Rachel Meyer and others, including Miles, who are specialists in that field. No, seriously, I think there are people who understand our world and can transition to the other. Miles. Genomics won't cut it alone. We need your context. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> we need each other. Okay, so yes. we need to work on Miles and something like the equivalent. Basically, to Have you ever met Rachel Meyer? I tell you. Yeah, yeah. She's she can't do my no. faith in humanity <laughs> and the youth of today is completely <laughs> sorted out. <laughs> As with all the student members, let me tell you, their present your presentations during this week were fantastic. Okay, any more questions? Comments? Okay. Ah, Cassie. If you had it all to do over again, would you do anything different? Ah. It's <laughs> <laughs> a loaded Well, I nearly became a fine, uh, I nearly did fine art. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, then I started with entomology and then I did my sort of, from a ecology background, I did what I did. And then later came to my social science of anthropology. Would I do it the same way around? <coughs> Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much. Pleasure. I also failed to mention in the beginning that as a part of this um, of being our DEB, you also are now a lifetime member of the society. And we hope that you'll continue to, to attend our meetings because you just really bring a, a great energy and expertise to, the, to us, so thank you. <laughs>